Sure. Yes, as I'm going, and right now it, it is open. And welcome, everyone. And uh, welcome to the session. It is titled and extending frugal innovation across borders. And there are many global and regions where local leaders are dispute across historical borders and that they don't perhaps accept. And at these times, and many are uh, maimed and the uh, lifestyle that dis disrupted. And they are well away from uh, high tech and all that means. And how can local frugal innovation be extended to all uh, contestants. And can these uh, developments ever be scaled to greatly benefit humanity or you know, who might lead these efforts? And for this session, I have got uh, two important, very, very you know, important and, uh, speakers. And uh, first of all, and uh, I, like, uh, I like to call on uh, Loli and to say something. And uh, before you start your own presentation, and I'd like you to uh, introduce yourself. And Dr. You know, Lodi, please do it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. <laughs> um, my name is Rory Steele. I serve as the Chief of Staff at With Honor Action, which is a cross-partisan movement dedicated mm -hmm. to promoting and advancing principled veteran leadership in elected public service in the United States. With Honor supports specifically uh, principled veteran leadership in our Congress, and we help to amplify their cross-partisan agenda to work together to find solutions for the American people. We've identified this hyper-partisanship and, uh, and combative nature of our politics that seems to be, uh, to be growing in nature over, the, over the, the past several years as a direct threat to our democracy. And so With Honor Action works to support, again, principled veteran leadership running for Congress, uh, to advance uh, to advance important priorities for the American people, specifically in, in the areas of national service. We believe that service is an imperative to really developing and growing within your community and developing a sense of uh, respect for others and a, a sense of uh, contribution to your communities at the you know the, the local, state, and federal level. We also work on uh, national security issues, specifically. AI, artificial intelligence, cyber initiatives. Um, and then we also support, you know, importantly, military family and veteran well-being uh, through several initiatives, uh, everything from, uh, from tax benefits to mental health resources to quality of living issues for our military families and veterans who served our, who served our country. I'm also a former Marine Corps veteran myself. Mm -hmm. I served uh, directly after high school. I was one of those guys who, uh, who needed a little bit of straightening out. And uh, my service in the Marine Corps, uh, you know, set a, a really, a really good trajectory for the rest. I learned a lot uh, about myself and about how to do uh, less or how to do more with less. Uh, it's something that the Marine Corps is very proud of is, uh, is, is, is taking what resources you have and using them to do the best of your ability. That experience directly uh, translated into my experience in political campaigns as a younger man. Uh, where oftentimes in, in uh, campaigns, you're, you don't have very many resources, but you have an incredible amount of work to do. So I've found, <clears throat> just to sort of you know, frame this conversation a little bit from my perspective, I've found that effective management, empowering people, giving them the opportunity uh, to exceed what they think they're capable of, is an incredible way to be you know, frugal with resources yet achieve, uh, achieve incredible results. Uh, I've, I've seen that at every level of our government. I've worked on campaigns from you know, small city council races to uh, president of the United States and everything in between. And I found that that management philosophy, uh, empowering and delegating and being you know, frugal with resources uh, has, has been a very productive management philosophy for myself. And it's one that I carry over into my current job at, at With Honor Action. Uh, I'm from the Seattle, Washington area of the United States. I currently live in Tucson, Arizona, and uh, I'm very excited to be here. And, and thank you for listening. Thank you so much. And uh, also, and uh, you know, I got some questions before asking a question. Then let's move on to the next person and uh, Dr. B. And uh, could you introduce yourself first? And uh, please, uh, you know, make a speech about this topic. Sure. So um, 
I'm Dr. Bernstein, Dr. B. Uh, I'm a New York boy. Uh, I was a parent's delight. I did everything I was supposed to do, which means I went to Harvard. I went to Cornell, did all the right things. Became a doctor, an internist, a surgeon. Uh, and after my seven years of surgical training, I was invited by Jonas Salk um, to work in his laboratory. Uh, and Roy, mm. you might not be old enough to know who Jonas Salk is, because oh, I know. <laughs> you know, for there's yes. some who don't know, you'd be surprised. Uh, <laughs> and what he said to me while I was working for him, I had I had a very close relationship with him, and he once said to me that you, you don't find very many people in this world who've ever done anything big. And what he was referring to, not building a big company and making lots of money, but having a very big impact on many, many, many people. And of course, he cured polio, which is 7 billion people in the world benefit from that today. Uh, so I thought I would, I would try and spend my time, which is all I have, trying to do big things. Um, and I have. Uh, I founded the, the, the company in the United States. It was the founder of the, of the wellness preventive medicine movement in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, I built the company... That, uh, that provided the software that was used to sequence the human genome. Um, and now I've started a company um, which has a whole new way of sterilizing surgical instruments. Uh, and Rory, as a Marine, you, I'm sure you'll understand this, um, that can sterilize surgical instruments without electricity, power, heat, uh, or water. None of those three. And it's taken a very, very complicated technology, the autoclave, your grandma's pressure cooker, uh, mm -hmm. And has turned it uh, into a very simple device, which can be used anywhere in the world, anytime, no matter what, mm -hmm. uh, which is very, very big. Uh, and Rory, just for your information, it's been evaluated <clears> by <throat> the military, and it meets all the needs for austere forward surgery. Uh, and we're, we're working with the U.S. Air Force now in San Antonio, uh, and we'll be working with SOCOM. So my motivation, my motivation is, is to have a big impact in the world. Um, and I just... To, to go a little bit further, I've learned very well from my training and my life experience that most of the very fancy modern things that we have in advanced societies, robotic surgery, for example, mm -hmm. uh, these, these technologies cannot be applied in most of the world, in the low and middle mm -hmm. income countries where they can't afford them. They don't have the, the ecosystem to support them. They don't have the staffing for it. They have nothing. Uh, and But they also lack the capability of making what they really need. And I can give, I'll come back later and give you all kinds of examples of that. But for me, frugal innovation is an academic term. And that's why, Roy, I'm glad you didn't read about it, because you could have spent a lot of time reading about all kinds of flow charts and circles and diagrams and everything else. But... Basically, frugal innovation is doing, keeping things really simple and trying to do it locally. That's what it is, right? Um, and so when we try and go over to a, a poor country and teach them how to build robotic surgery, that's a waste of time, right? Right. Yeah. If, we, if we try and sell them a $6,000 titanium pin for a broken tibia, which you get when you have <laughs> ride a motorcycle, <laughs> That doesn't work either. When they could be manufacturing those locally, probably for fifty dollars a piece, but they mm -hmm. don't. And I can come back to why. There's a lot of whys for that, but mm -hmm. that's that's why I do what I do. I'm very committed to frugal innovation, and I suspect that's why I was put on this panel. Mm -hmm. Thank but you. I also, and, I, yeah. I just, just, I think that the, the skill set and the focus that Roy has um, could be easily translated and applied with massive leverage in the developing world. So that's what I'm going to try and get you to do, Rory. I'm going to come after you as soon as this conference is over, and I'm going to talk to you about how we can get you to focus on doing something where it's really needed, hmm. right? Yeah. Really. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Bernstein. And I think it's really, you know, it's, it's incredible. Yeah, go on, buddy. It's, it's not just sort of, you know, the the technology or the, the innovation, but it's the people that you need also. Of course. To yeah. Happen, you know, and, and people like you who are, you know, who are reaching to, uh, to innovate and develop new technologies that are helpful. Uh, so congratulations on your success. Mm. Very interesting. Well, oh, yeah, and, uh, and I can, <coughs> can I ask you, right? <clears throat> In your area, when, when it comes to, uh, you know, frugal innovation, frugal items, what are very effective? 
And what kind of things do you do you remember? <clears throat> well, I, I think that it's, it's uh, uh, people oftentimes will underestimate the power of of person to person contact. Uh, you know, person to person. Yeah, talking to talking to people, uh, building a connection, uh, helping them understand the issues, maybe educating them on their, their abilities or their personal power. I think、mm-hmm. a lot of times in in my world, people will often rely on、um, you know excessive technology. I like to say that sort of you know politics and political campaigning it's a it's a combination of a of an art and science. You know,、uh, mm-hmm. there, there's definitely some data and analytics that are very important to what I do. But if you don't have the right person executing,、uh, you know, with those with those tools, it's it's not worth much at all. So I, I spend a lot of time really developing talent, really working with people to, uh, uh, you know, to to,、uh, you know, to perform at the best of their abilities,、um, to be,、uh, you know, commonsensical. I think a lot of times people often overthink politics, and it really is just about sort of making a connection with people. If you have the ability to do that, I would take. You know, I would take a, 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 you know, I would take one of those people over ten people who might have sort of a technological or technology、uh, background or or skill set to them, because I think、mm-hmm. that there's still elements of our world that really does rely on you know person to person contact. Technology, technology. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Can I comment? 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 When you think back to maybe to your Marine days, have you ever found yourself somewhere where you have to get up in front of thirty people from another country that don't know you from Adam? They have no idea who you are,、uh, and and your goal is somehow to、uh, transfer knowledge to them.、Mm-hmm. So、when you when you get done, they've learned something.、Mm-hmm. I don't know if you ever tried to do that, but that's very that is no different than campaigning. For office,、right. it is absolutely no different. It's the same skill set, right? And you, what I'm thinking is that, for me, the most effective political campaigning is when you knock on a door and you talk to somebody. It's、That's、not、right. an ad on TV. You、right. can't teach somebody how to sterilize an instrument in Sierra Leone、yeah. with a video. You have to be there and talk to them and show them with your hands, and you have to be there,、right. and you have to be able to communicate with them. So the The skill that you have in doing that is totally translatable into other avenues. Just so you know,、mm-hmm. yeah. I, I I believe that you know. Not, yeah, I, yeah. I've come across a lot of people、uh, <clears throat> in my line of work who, you know, it, it it really just does come down to being personal, to being resourceful, to to figuring out and making it happen. If I can share just one quick story to maybe illustrate that point, you know, I, I was working for a senator here in the United States and. I got a, you know, we're setting up a, a, a TV commercial shoot, and we had, you know, nine different locations that we had to secure everything from, you know, a park setting to a office setting and everything in between. And、uh, you know, the night before we're supposed to make this video shoot,、uh, I get a call from my boss, and she says, you know, we need a gas station tomorrow morning. We were talking about the prices of of gas in this commercial. I said, "There's no way I can find a, a, you know, a gas station by tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. It's like 6:30 at night. You know, all the owners have gone home." She said, "Figure it out," and she hung、right. up on. Me, you know,、right. so you know, I took a minute, you know, to, you know, how, how, you know, how dumb my boss was, and then I calmed down, took some deep breaths, and I started thinking. And I remembered that a guy that I had played poker with two weeks before, he worked at a gas station. You know, and I called him up, and I, you know, I, I know this is sort of a silly story, but it just goes to my point of, you know, if if you if you have the right people on your team,、uh, people who will stop and think and be resourceful with the resources that they have to the best of their ability, you can accomplish anything. You know, and that's what happened with us. I mean, I know it's a small story, but you know, next morning we had our we had our video shoot. The senator was very happy. Was very happy, and we figured it out. And to me, that's sort of what. You know,、uh, making do with the limited resources that you have when you have a good person who can extend、uh, and and stretch themselves a little bit and make things happen is is really key to the castle. <clears throat> okay, Doctor, you know, Doctor B, and、yes. uh, in your field and、uh, surgery or you know、uh, physical field, physical med- medication field, and when when it comes to frugal innovation, what kind of thing do you do you remember? Yeah, so. It's a very, it's a very complex question. So, I'm going to tell you what, 
what um, the goal is, what the mm. goal is, and then what do I do about it? So mm. the goal is to be able to, wherever you are, and we're talking now about lesser developed countries. Oh, okay. We're talking about downtown mm. Philadelphia, downtown Tokyo, or Seattle. Mm. We're talking about mm. uh, the Princess Christian Hospital in Freetown, Sierra Leone, right? Mm. Or we're talking about a hospital in you know rural Ethiopia. Uh, mm. And they don't have, they're not any different than we are when it comes to their health. They have the mm. same diseases, mm. mostly. They have mm. the same needs, but they don't have, they don't have the technology or the people mm. or anything. And, and so the goal is how do you, not how do you export the American healthcare system to mm. Sierra Leone or Ethiopia, because it isn't all that good anyway, and it's very, very expensive. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you, what do you have to do to get a local, a country like Ethiopia to be able to design and build and train and create the whole ecosystem required to support a healthcare system yeah. locally? Okay. And it's very, very different than what we have here. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can, you're, you're about people. And so the problem with people is, what is the best way to train people? And we can't do it the way we train, for example, surgeons in America, where it takes 11 years after college to become a surgeon. That doesn't work, right? right. Um, so in the, de in the developing world, we try and create a, someone with surgical capabilities right. um, with six months of training who has no college degree. Hmm. And when, when I was growing up, I was a little kid. My mother used to go to Cameroon in Africa and teach natives, as she called them, how to do eye surgery. And they could even read. Oh, really? They were illiterate, but they could do wonderful eye surgery. So mm. that's the people side. And then you have the, you have the technical side. Um, and that's a whole other issue as well. And, you know, using, using digital technology to solve some of mm. the problems of the developing world is very nice. But it doesn't solve some of the major problems, like how do you have sterile instruments? So uh, I, I decided to try and come up with a low technology yeah. solution to a huge problem that could mm -hmm. be at the end of the day, manufactured locally. Doesn't have to be manufactured in Bloomington, Minnesota or Portland, Oregon or in Tucson, Arizona. It could be manufactured there. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're going to do that and you decide to do that, you learn that frugal innovation has requires an entire ecosystem. You have to have, a financial community that can support investment. There are no angel networks to speak of that will support young entrepreneurs. You have to have engineering schools. You have to have business schools. You have to have a government that can, that can protect intellectual property. You have to have licensing for professionals. You have to have all the models. And, and, and you, you can't just set up an incubator like we do in the United States or in J Japan, probably where you, you get hotshot kids out of college who want to, you know, start a business and you put them in a business incubator because we have the entire ecosystem already there. So all it, a kid walks into that ecosystem, it's all there. Well, but go pitch yourself to the angel investors. You go find a lawyer that can write the contract. You can get insurance. The laws right. permit you to do this. We have the FDA. It's all there. Well, frugal innovation doesn't happen by itself. So <laughs> that's, that's the problem. And so I see someone like you, Rory, and I'm going to say, wow, if I could get you interested in the in the person side of this, good heavens! <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, yeah. your leverage would be huge. So yeah. that's mm. that's a quick. That's so. I'm trying to. I had taken a very small slice, which is sterilizing surgical instruments. Um, yeah. But I realized in doing that that it's a much. You have to do a lot more than that. Sure. Because if you're yes. going to do, oh. do surgery, you have to have anesthesia, right? If you're going to do surgery, you have to have someone who can do surgery. And so on and so on and so on and so on. Right. It goes on and on. Okay, right. No, no, would you want to say something? No? Okay. And, uh, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, the Japanese government and uh, supported an African country by sending, you know, high-tech machinery or something or something like that. But most of them uh, remained unused for many years, actually. And uh, that's one example. And uh, in order to uh, make use of uh, the kind of high-tech uh, innovation, I think uh, they need uh, human resources to, to 
to take advantage of that, or and, uh, and there are needed kind of and fundamental things are needed for for using that kind of high tech machine or something. So from right. that point of view, I think we have got even though this is not, in, not innovation. One thing is that we have been using a kind of net in summer to protect the, you know mosquitoes from coming in. Just like that, just a simple net. Right. We send a huge simple net to 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 prevent and the local people from having a, uh, having a, some local Malaria. disease. Yeah. yeah. Yes, that's right. Right. It worked very well like that. This is not innovation, but uh, things have been using for many used for many years in Japan. That, that kind of thing is that the one way. Okay, right? so professor. Yes, professor. Yes, go on. I I like that one. That's a very good example. All right. Mm. Something as simple as mosquito netting. Mos- mosquito limits. netting, yeah, that's right. right. So where is it manufactured? Wait, it's not yeah, that's the point. Where, <laughs> yeah. It's not manufactured <laughs> that's in Africa. Point. And uh, right now in Japan, there. yeah, it's so, not manufactured there. No, it's manufactured in Denmark or Japan or in China or wherever, and it has to be imported. Okay, yeah. so the, the, the frugal innovation mm. It's not the mosquito netting. It's can you make, get it manufactured locally? What does it take to manufacture yeah. something as useful as mm. mosquito netting locally? Try and do I that. I think they can do that. Yeah, they yeah. can do so that. So yeah. if, if I said to you mm. where you are in Japan, well, um, your your job is without talking to anybody mm. who knows anything, mm. set up a mosquito net factory. Mm. Well, that'd be very easy to do hmm. where you are. I mean, hmm. with you, just with your connections, you pick up the phone, you call a few people, hmm. you, you hmm. call a few universities, you call a few companies, uh, hmm. and you talk to the guard, there'd be money. You'd have it up and running in six months. Hmm. Right? Okay. okay. But if I said to you, well, hop a plane just for fun and go to Sierra Leone. Hmm. That's a nice place to go. It's interesting. Right on there. Uh, they have a serious problem with mosquitoes. And set, yes, up a fa- set up a factory there. But the mm. rule is you ha- the locals have to do it all. You can't mm. do it for them. Mm. Yeah. Well, yeah, try that. Know, so that's... Yes, uh, Loy, Lo- go on. Well, you know, Dr. Bernstein, uh, you know, I'm just sort of jotting down some notes here because what you were saying about creating the ecosystem, even as something as simple as mosquito netting, you still need the investors. You know, you still need the raw materials. You right. still need the manufacturing. Yeah, right. You still need the management. You still need the distribution. You, you still got need it. You, yeah. you, got you, it. You, you see, you didn't have to read anything about that. <laughs> That's my point. Right? You didn't have to waste your time looking at silly diagrams. You well, just know you that, right? You it very well, doctor. Yeah, you explained it very well. So, right. uh, but, but, you know, but, but it's interesting. It's this, it's this simple thing you know, mosquito nets that still requires an ecosystem. Exactly it. right. You, you got to have it. Mm, yeah. You know, people, I, I'm going to tell you a funny story, but talking about ecosystem. I, I live in Washington, D.C. Mm. And years ago, uh, I lived on a nice street. Uh, and we had between the sidewalk and the street, there was an open area where I planted a garden. Mm. And I had a neighbor who at the time was the IRS commissioner. Mm. Now, you don't get to be the IRS commissioner unless you're a pretty big shot and pretty well-educated, pretty smart, done a lot of things in your life, right? Mm. Yeah. But I'm telling you that the IRS commissioner did not know how to pick a tomato. Yeah. Really? <laughs> no. I had tomatoes, and he brought, his kid, he, he brought his kids down, mm. okay? And there were the mm. tomatoes, and he looked at them, and I said, well, you know, this is for your kids. Pick the tomatoes. Well, how do you do that? Hmm. Uh, that's my point. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it, okay. All right. So, so y- it, y- you can't assume anything. So, hmm. getting people to use mosquito net is way hmm. down the line, right? If you can't manufacture hmm. it, lo- if there was a local factory, people would be using it a lot more because Charlie, my friend, would be making it, right? Come on, you got to use hmm. this stuff. I'm making it. No, hmm. We're importing it from China. Hmm. What is this funny stuff, right? So, okay. yeah. Okay. Dr. Bernie, what, what gave you the idea to pursue it, uh, anywhere? It, and I'm sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly, but what, what gave you the motivation or the idea to pursue that idea? Uh, the idea for which? For, for your company, anywhere? Yeah. Yeah, 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 anywhere. Well, 
So I'm, I'm always looking. I've never had an idea in my life. All right. <laughs> okay. I've never had an original idea and I don't know how to do anything. Right. But I'm very curious and I can identify good people and I listen a lot. Right. Mm. So, um, and I'm a surgeon and I know what the problems are. Um, and I'm interested in solving the problems. And if you, it, did you, did any, did you ever ride a merry-go-round growing up? Sure. Do you know what the expression is to grab for the gold ring? No. No. Well, uh, and Professor, you might not know this, but we have merry-go-rounds in the United States and, and they're horses that go up and down. You go around and around. And, yes, yes. Yeah. And, and it's a good merry-go-rounds. There's a gold ring on a string. Really? <laughs> which, yeah, which, which well, what, the kids are going around and around and around and it, all of a sudden a gold ring drops down. And really? The kid, yeah, and if the kid sitting on a horse can grab it and break the string, the thread that holds it, <laughs> they, get a, they get a stuffed animal. Oh. So, so kids got taught hmm. to, to look for the gold ring, grab the gold ring. Hmm. And we have an expression to grab the gold ring. Well, grab that's, the gold that's, ring. Yeah, that's teaching kids how to be, if you know what you're trying to do, keep your eyes open for it. Because if you're not looking for it, you miss it. Oh. So I'm always looking for solutions to big problems. Hmm. So, so. Grabbing gold ring is in the you know, find a solution. Met, when I, when hmm. I met a Russian on an airplane. Hmm who talked to me about genomics and software, I had him come to my house for six months and we started the largest bioinformatics company in the world mm. uh, from nothing. Okay. So a, a young fellow shows up at my, my house with a little idea to sterilize blood platelets. Mm. And he want me to, wanted me to help him with his idea. Mm. Uh, and to make a long story story, his idea was not correct. But I started a company that created an entirely new way to sterilize stuff. Mm. Nitrogen dioxide gas smog, and it occurred to me, right in front of me, that that was a solution to a huge problem, which was sterilizing surgical instruments without electricity, which I knew mm. from doing missionary medicine in India and mm. Latin America while I was in medical school it was a huge problem. Mm. And I'm not ever interested, in, uh, Professor. You know this. You don't if you if you make something, you don't you don't try and um, do something and then find the problem that it suit that it fits. Right. Mm -hmm. You don't build a solution in search of a problem. You build a a solution for a problem that you've identified. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is a huge problem. So when this came along, I said, "Whoa, I think I can do this. Mm -hmm. Okay, Um, Mm -hmm. But you try and find somebody to invest. Invest, I see that we have I see that we have Mm -hmm. a uh, somebody listening who's a runs a capital firm. (laughs) (laughs) Somebody listening. Two guys are listening right now. you, You try and you try and find somebody who's willing to invest. And yes, a I know. Crazy uh, idea to yeah. make a sterilizer for the funny yes. people in Africa. Forget it. Very hard. So right. we. So we. That okay. answers your now, question. We did. Now it. getting to a very important core question, actually, and uh, we have got uh, you know uh, ten more minutes, I think. So that's why this will be the final yeah. question. Then, okay, you said that frugal and innovation. If I may say, you know, frugal, you know, traditional items. We have got a lot of things. Oh, in the United States, there are so many things, and uh, which will be useful in African countries or in uh, less developed countries. I think. In that case, if you're going to make it a business, if you transfer and that kind of uh, technology into uh, local areas uh, smoothly, we need some kind of business model. I think, but it it wouldn't work well right now. So, what are the challenges? When it comes to uh, transferring that kind of traditional items into local local areas, what is the challenges? Challenge for here or there? And uh, here, maybe here yeah. or there. I don't know. Both, well, both right, areas. Reason, yeah. There are a the lot of difficulties, I think. Yeah. I'll, yes, I'll tell you the on. challenge here. Uh, and Rory, since you're in the world of politics, you probably would not disagree with me. This country spends more money Mm. per capita than any other country in the world that we rank about 26 in the world in terms of mm. Mm. outcome all right mm. so so i firmly believe because mm. the cost of health care is so high in this country mm. that you're going to see frugal innovation from outside the united states that's mm. going to get exported and brought into the united states they're going to show as the indians did that you can do a cataract for five dollars instead of 
fifty thousand dollars, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, right. You probably follow Dr. Reddy in India, right? Who does bypass surgery, but he has this automated surgical p- approach. So I think, I think there's a huge room for frugal innovation in the United States. Huge. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's a political problem there, which is that the people who make a lot of money don't want to, do not want to do it for less money. You know, as as you were saying that, yeah, Dr. no, yes, yeah, as you were saying that, Doctor B, I'm I'm thinking about the pharmaceutical companies specifically mm-hmm. here in the United States. You know, there's there's a reason why, you know, medication here is is you know oftentimes so much more expensive than yeah, in other yeah. in other yeah. countries. It's it's a political problem. It's not of course a it is. Yeah, I, and, and I will, by the way, uh, just, I'll tell you this because it's so relevant. We're we're dealing with the developing world. Okay, USAID, which is the, the the arm of the U.S. government, that spends billions of dollars on foreign aid, mm-hmm. and they're and they're big companies, and where you probably know some of them, the are big big companies that are these so-called USAID contractors, and they have hundreds of millions of dollars of contracts to provide training and healthcare all over the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so in Africa, in Africa, one of the major interventions to prevent AIDS is male circumcision. Mm-hmm. And USAID has put up a lot of money for, for voluntary male circumcision. And the average cost for USAID using disposable instruments, which have to be disposed of and incinerated, polluting the air, is about mm-hmm. a, over $100 per circumcision. Mm-hmm. And we can sterilize six circumcision sets that could be reused for $20. Mm. $20 versus $120. So I met with the head of the largest USAID contractor who does a lot of this work. And I said, how would you like to help us? He said, Mm. what are you talking about? He said, do you realize how much overhead I would lose if I could do this for less? Mm. Yeah, right. I mean, so so anyway, there's, well, a, there's a huge opportunity for frugal innovation in the United States. Huge. Well, mm-hmm. yeah. And, and, you know, it, it, it again, it reminds me of something that we were talking about before the session began about politics is, you know, it's, it's the, it's the action of deciding who gets what. Yeah. And in mm-hmm. our, in our political system that is often decided by, you know, who the largest donors, contributors, lobbyists are. Uh, and so it's, it's sort of a, a problem that, that trickles down and manifests itself uh, mm-hmm. on people who need, you know, prescription drugs, but can't afford it or. Yeah. So uh, you know. that's the way it is. And where I think that I'd love to have, have a more like to sit down with you, but I think mm-hmm. the political, I was very, I didn't, you probably don't know this, but when Jimmy Carter was running for president, I was the chief health policy advisor for him. Wow. So I've, I've had a lot of political experience. I, I come out of mm-hmm. California. I was a major player there. I ran local government. The, I think the issue is, is even more fundamental than that, which is given given that you spend whatever percent of the GDP on healthcare is, not mm-hmm. who, who gets what, but what's the best way to get the highest yield from that? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So yeah. just yeah. to make the point, I th- what well, I don't know what it is today, but somewhere it's like thirty or forty percent of the entire uh, public healthcare expenditure goes for the last twenty days of life. Yeah. Well, number one uh, reason for bankruptcy, too, right? In the United yeah. States. Yeah. So, personal bankruptcy. All right. So, anyway, Professor, I don't mean to talk so much. <laughs> you know, that's okay. That's okay. And, uh, you know, before we start today's session, we discussed about uh, ivermectin. Ivermectin things. Ivermectin is a very cheap, you know, uh, medicine right now. Yeah. And uh, everybody uh, can use it freely. And uh, some people, and uh, Dr. B, you have got the opposition, but uh, some people say that I've evicted and uh, worked very well for preventing and uh, coronavirus. Some people say that. But the, most of the, the very big, uh, you know, pharmaceutical company quite reluctant to uh, uh, produce it because it, it wouldn't cause, an, you know, generate a lot of money, right? Yeah. That's one thing, and that you know, you, this an- anecdote can be applicable to uh, to uh, and the frugal innovation or traditional innovation and transfer from advanced country to less advanced con- country. Yeah. Uh, by then the way, work, it, yeah, just, yeah, as sure. you say, it, so we could decide. Mm. Okay, we're going to go and set up a a vaccine manufacturing facility in um, Uganda. Hmm. 
Good luck. Again, yeah. 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 Good luck. Yeah. It's more than just giving money and sending the parts in a box. <laughs> right? <laughs> you have to have the whole system for regulating it. You have to be able to build it. You have to have enough people who can know what they're doing to manage it. Mm. It's not, you know, if you put me in charge of a, of a, farm, of a vaccine manufacturing facility, I wouldn't know where to start. Mm. I'd have no idea. Mm. And I'm a pretty educated guy. Mm. Um, I could learn, but it might take mm. me a year. So mm. the idea that we just quickly drop the stuff into countries is like bananas. Mm. Okay. 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 And I've got a few more minutes. So and let me move on to another question. Another question that will be the final question, I think. But uh, there's a, you know, someone in Africa and uh, he invented. And during the you know pandemic, during the you know epidemic, I think, and he invented and uh, artificial respiration, artificial respiration, artificial you know respiration, yeah, artificial respiration without using electricity, like this. And uh, frugal innovation, I think, uh, when it comes to simply exporting frugal innovation to a uh, less advanced nation is not rea uh, realistic. In that case, I think we encourage uh, local people uh, to, uh, to uh, you know, uh, to invent something frugal and according to uh, the level of economic development and uh, in their, you know, economic settings. So that's one way. For that purpose, What will be necessary for us to do that? And the people living in an advanced country, what should we do? I, I agree with you on that. I, I don't like the term frugal innovation. I don't like any okay. term. I don't like any term where when you Google it, you get a, a thousand yeah, frugal is bad, charts bad, and diagrams, bad. right? So, oh, okay, yes. All right. So I think, I think it's been very clear. One of mm. the great benefits of the pandemic, if there were any, But that, mm. that African leaders, because they couldn't travel, discovered that they didn't have a health care system. And they said, holy cow, we better do something about that. We better be able to mm. start being, doing that ourselves. And guess what? General Motors figured out mm. because of the pandemic that they mm. better start making chips in America because they couldn't build cars without the chips that they expected to get from somewhere else. Mm. So, mm. so I think that the world is realizing that, that a lot of things – have to do locally even though we have mm. a very interconnected world mm. the, 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 the basic knowledge to me should be shared globally mm. and then the local communities have to figure out how to take that knowledge and apply it, it to their mm. situation so mm. um, that's I mean I'm not I'm belaboring the obvious there but mm. I think too many people think that it's much easier to you know teach someone how to build a Tesla to build a bicycle, right? <laughs> to get around. It's a bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, maybe. Okay, Roy, and uh, would you want to say something about that, this kind of topic? You know, I, I agree with Dr. Bernstein. You know, I think I'll just, I'll leave it with that. It is, it all, it does matter at the local level and, uh, and filters up from there. So I think I'll just let Dr. B's words stand on. Oh, come one. on, Rory. You're, you're a wise man. You've been around a long time, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, I, I, I just, I really do agree with, you know, what you were saying about, you know, letting the, the local level filter up. And uh, mm -hmm. I think it's incredibly important. And the more that you're able to uh, engage people, you know, people are a great multiplier. So, you know, you get one or two people on your team, they get three or four, they get five or six, they get 10 to 12. So, you know, I, I think that that's a, a really integral part of, 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 of uh, competitive innovation and frugal innovation is, is being able to have an idea that, uh, that multiplies and that uh, expands its impact, uh, you know, in, in a very, um, I'm blanking on the word right now, but uh, a compound interest type of way, it just grows and grows mm -hmm. and grows. So. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, yes. I love a lot, actually, and uh, when it comes to frugal innovation, I think we tend to innovate something there, but and, uh, and according to the development of history, economy, and uh, advanced country must have a lot of things, lots of seas that will be used for, for the local economy, I think, and uh, less, less advanced countries. 
So, and, uh, but in, in, in America or in, the, in Japan, that kind of business has been already gone away. But we try to find something which would be useful for less advanced countries, I think. And that's one way. So, but also, yeah, so, go on. So, Professor, yes. you, you teach at a business school. Yes, right. All right. So, my responsibility, so, you mean? So, you're, you, you are the high priest for these students. Yes, right. Uh, and you, you can show them the way, mm. right? Yeah. So they think they're going to business school so they can make a lot of money running a pharmaceutical company in Japan or make mm. whatever they're going to do or mm. working for Toyota, making lots mm. of money. But they can mm. also decide they could go over and spend a year or two helping to teach people how to whatever it is no, kind of, yeah, in, a, yeah, in a, right. another, another part mm. of the world where they really need that. And maybe you could do, maybe you could develop a. From your place, you could develop an exchange program with it with an mm, embryonic that, business that, school yeah, in, yeah. Um, you know, Burundi. <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. right. I think so. Right. Okay. And have exchange yes. students. I mean, that's yes, thank you. Then, that could, that you're a wise man. You've been around a while. That leverages your time. You've got mm. another thirty years if you put your mind to it. You could probably teach several thousand business students around the world. Yeah. Right. Anyway, that's what I and I should take away. And uh, but anyway, finally. And uh, let me ask uh, Loi, and uh, do you have any takeaway from uh, today's discussion? No, I, I just I really appreciate this conversation. I, I feel like I, I've learned a lot. Thank you so much. And uh, finally, Dr. Yeah, Dr. B, and uh, what is your takeaway today from today's discussion? Well, I'm, um, <laughs> we started out this conversation with, with Rory saying, well, I didn't have time to read about frugal innovation. <laughs> So I really apologize. Uh, <laughs> and it turns out that he knows more about frugal innovation than most of the professors who, who write well, about it. Well, I had some good coaches um, along the way, so thank you. <laughs> That's yes, true. Right. Uh, and my, what my takeaway is I'm going to try and harness the, the wisdom and the energy of, of both of you guys and get you to start getting high yield for your time, leveraging your time. Mm -hmm. Because there's 7 billion people in the world. That could benefit yeah. from what you do, not just 300 million in the United States. No, no, no. The population of the United States, 300 million divided by 7 billion is a rounding error of one, mm, I think. Mm. One tenth or one one hundredth or whatever it is. It's nothing. Mm. So just okay. keep that in mind. That's my takeaway. Thank you so much. And the time has been exhausted. And uh, I want to see and the uh, speakers and uh, someday in the future, I think, and uh, physically, yeah, face and to face. And I've enjoyed yes. meeting both of you. And please let me know how I can help you do what you do. Thank you. Yes. Thank right. you. Anything Thank you so much. I'd be happy to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.